Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Coffee Shop Philosophy. As always, I'm your host, Killian Hobbs, news editor for the Being Libertarian family of publications and the managing editor specifically for think-liberty.com. As always, you can follow us on social media feeds. You can contact us directly. You can watch our videos on YouTube, listen to our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, and check out the shops for a bunch of amazing and interesting merch that's available there. Now, at this point, since you're listening to this, you would have already heard about the passing of Stan Lee. Now, for the maybe two of you out there that haven't heard of him, Stan Lee was infamous for his work with Jack Kirby and the creation of the Marvel Universe, um, setting up a bunch of the characters that we've all come to know and love. Uh, I know that, uh, for the most part, many of you may not care about most celebrity deaths. I know I'm in the same boat. I just find that it's a, you know an interesting piece of news. It's not something that really hits home at all. But I can definitely say that hearing about his passing definitely was something that struck a little bit closer to home than it normally would. Now, I mention this because the theme of today's episode is talking about going from media to morals. So I use Stan as a great example here because of how many moral and philosophical lessons that he tried to impart to people through his works at Marvel Comics. Now, obviously, comic books aren't the only form of media or the only form of publication that you're going to get insights into morals or different ideas from almost every form, even video games today, try to give you some sort of either philosophical point or some sort of political point or just general ideological point to work from or an idea that they're trying to imbue in you through their characters and their stories. So what I wanted to talk about today was what we can gain from media and the different types of stories and the different types of philosophies and ideas that come out of those stories that I personally have been affected by and personally have changed the way that I see the world because of and the ways that we can pull these morals and pull these philosophical ideas out of the media that we consume. So in honor of Stan Lee, I'll start with the man himself. Now, while he was known and loved for many of his creations, the one that I want to focus on here is the Silver Surfer. Originally created in 1966 and eventually given his own comic book run in 1968, the Silver Surfer was a character that really became Stanley's mouthpiece when it came to his own philosophy and his own ideas. Here he had a character that was an outsider, someone that was different, someone that was completely disconnected and unrelated to anything that was going on on Earth, so could work as an impartial observer and really just view humanity and the planet and the things that we go through in an almost objective level. Now, obviously it wasn't completely objective because it was being written by a human here on Earth, but the idea that the character was that, you know, he was a herald of a demigod Galactus. He would travel the cosmos, finding planets for him, imbued with special powers, uh, a whole bunch of other now considered comic book tropes, but at the time groundbreaking ideas. But this character was different from the other ones. The Hulk smashes. You know, Bruce Wayne turns into Batman and goes fights criminals on a nightly basis because he's that driven by justice. Superman was, you know, truth, justice, the American way. The Silver Surfer, on the other hand, had problems. The Silver Surfer had immense personal tragedy, as well as a very over-the-top, almost Shakespearean way of working through every problem and thinking about every aspect of everything that he was dealing with. In one of the initial storylines with him, he ends up being exiled to Earth. And one line that he says that I always, uh, I always just found very interesting, or at least very just funny to think of, was a line where he says, And now to face what may well be my greatest challenge, I shall walk among men in an effort to fathom their madness. This entire character who travels the cosmos, deals with tons of other species on other planets, comes to Earth and has to try almost to no avail 
to understand people, to understand our inner workings, to understand the way that we treat each other, to understand things like war, the famines, to understand what we do to each other, the way we treat each other, the way that we view things and think. All in all, it was a pretty heavy character. And so unlike the other characters of the time, most of the other characters were, again, pretty straightforward. But here you had a character that experienced deep sorrow and would enter into a depression and withdraw from humanity because he could not understand them. And he was always viewed as an outsider and was turned off by humanity's inherent xenophobia. This was uh, the, the original run with this character only lasted 18 issues before the, the plug was pulled and they went back to more standard superhero shenanigans. But it gave an insight into what I would probably say is one of the earlier attempts at pushing philosophy through comics. Now, it wasn't the first attempt, but it was the first time that you had a character that was created almost solely to be the philosophical mouthpiece of the artist. You would have things such as, you know, Captain America years earlier punching Nazis telling you that, yeah, this is absolutely terrible. They need to go down. That's my stance. And that's a pretty basic stance. I'd say it's more just a political stance than a philosophical stance. But this character was a real mouthpiece for the idea. And it also led the way for more topics like this or more characters like this to develop as time went on. If you look at comic books today, almost none of them are actually written for children anymore. Most comic books these days are designed for the kind of people that grew up reading them. They're designed for people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, filled with deep, heavy-hitting topics and different social commentary and all of these deeper, richer ideas that the artists and the writers that are behind these works are trying to impart to their audience. Now, we can look outside of comic books, and I'll, I'll move on from Stan Lee for the moment here. We can look into just about any form of media, and you will find these different pieces that really try to sell you on an idea, or they try to express a certain concept in a way that it may very well change and pretty much should change the way that you see and view the world. I'll use, a, I'll use the popular movie The Purge as an example. In the movie The Purge, uh, the first one before there's 20,000 spinoffs all doing the same thing, the original movie starts off with a defense system salesman He's going around having a normal day, and you discover watching the movie that the United States has new founding fathers, and they've implemented this system called The Purge, which is a once-a-year, roughly 12-hour period where all crime is legal. There is no policing, no anything, full-on worst-case scenario anarchy. And I need to stress that for certain people out there that might be listening to this that looks at that as a obvious dig at anarchists in general. But pure worst-case, every person lets out the worst of themselves kind of anarchy. And it follows the family, and mainly you're supposed to identify with what their fears are, the issues they're running into, the way that they're scared, and the the, the kind of emotional turmoil that they're going through. But the entire backdrop is dependent on this idea that people, or at least a good chunk of people, are naturally that kind of violent. It's selling you on the idea that if America ever had that kind of freedom, that this is what they would do with it. It gives you the idea that this would become almost acceptable because of who gets purged. When you follow the movie, the one of the big tones to it is the fact that unemployment keeps going down and the economy keeps going up. The economy keeps going up every time that this happens because a whole bunch of psychotic rich people are going around killing off the homeless and killing off people on welfare and the lower dregs of society that they think, well, we can get rid of these people because it's the purge and I can get away with it. The movie doesn't end off by telling you what's right or what's wrong. It just shows you what these people face, what this hypothetical scenario could look like and what it could turn into. And it doesn't in such a way that it's the backdrop rather than the foreground. 
the foreground is the the horror that the family is facing and the violence and everything like that. But the idea is still there. It still paints this picture that there is that type of violence that people are capable of. It paints the idea that if we try to do something like this, this is a way it could turn out. This is an idea that we could try or an idea that we could look at. And this is how it could play out. This is the damage that it could bring. This is where we see these kind of emotional stances turned into policy and it becoming disastrous. We see people's inner hatreds and the things that they suppress and everything else manifest in a violent way in this movie, which tries to, without directly, tries to preach almost more tolerance or more understanding of people in different classes or people in different groups so that you don't have this kind of built up deep seated rage that you need to go on a 12 hour spree to purge yourself from every year. Another great example of this, and I'll, uh, I'll use another horror movie as an example here was the original Hellraiser. Now, most people know the character Pinhead, um, character that has all the spikes and the head laid out in a grid made up of nails and primarily dresses in leather and comes along with the other Cenobites to drag souls to hell after opening a puzzle box. Originally, it was based on a little novella written by Clive Barker. It was a small little 80-page thing um, where the character was portrayed a little bit differently, but there's still a big idea that's in play in the back of this. Now, for those of you that haven't seen it, it came out in the 80s, so I'm not going to worry about spoiling it. Get over it. Now, this movie, the story goes that person finds the box, opens the box, gets dragged into hell, tortured everything else. Another person finds the box. This person escapes from hell, tries to reclaim their life, so on and so forth, but is just a generally nasty individual anyway. Girl brings forth the Cenobites by solving the box, and before they drag her to hell, she makes a, an agreement with them to get him back into hell rather than her. Makes a trade, if you will. The movie won a whole bunch of accolades in the horror community for the way the character was portrayed and the type of horror character that it was, considering that most horror villains at the time were very straightforward, almost monster of the week type entities as we would consider it today. They weren't really driven by a philosophy or anything like that unless they were full-on vaudevillian villains. But in this movie, the main character, Pinhead, the leader of them all, they work from the concept of experience if you go through the novelizations of the character. In the original novella, the character is not necessarily from hell. The character is from a different plane of existence where the concepts of pain and pleasure reach such a zenith that there is no difference between them. That was the original rendition of the character and the Cenobites. They all look mangled and tortured, but they're in almost a form of ecstasy because that's what they are perceiving their state as being. That's what they're going through, having reached this zenith of experience. So in the background of this, they, they cling to the ideas of desire and the ideas of wanting more from life, and it paints the picture of not wanting to jump that far ahead. You have these entities that are basically demons from hell. They're not technically in the original novella, but for all the media forward, demons from hell, who reach this zenith of experience that we would consider absolutely horrifying and terrifying, but in its original conception is just the zenith of experience. It's not something that's different. So from a movie like that, even though it was a you know, it had the standard 80s levels of cheese that you expect from a horror movie. Not as bad as your standard slasher flicks, but still pretty bad for some of the dialogue that was involved. Um, Clyde Barker, absolutely brilliant horror writer. Not the best track run when it comes to adaptations on film. Just, just not the, just not the best. If you've ever seen Candyman or, uh, Master of Illusions, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. He has not had a good run on film, but in written form, his works are amazing. That's a just a side note. If you've only ever based your knowledge of the man off of his uh, movies, then you know 
fix that, undo that disservice you did to yourself and actually go read his work. It's absolutely brilliant if you love the genre. Back to the point here, though, it gives us a story of not going overboard in our desires. It gives a story of not aiming for different experiences just for the sake of those experiences and pushing ourselves to that point where we go so far over that we could see ourselves becoming like a Cenobite. It's one of those, it's similar to the uh, the Purge story where it's one of those things where it sits in the background. It's not something they spell out to you. It's not something they throw in your face, but the story is there driven in the background by this ideological narrative. It's driven by the idea that these are some lessons you should take from this, even if they're not putting it in a nice package, wrapping it in a bow and dropping it at your feet saying, hey, please pick this up. Like you see with a lot of uh, Superman stories where they're very straightforward and what they say is right and wrong. Stories like that do it with a lot more nuance. Uh, I mean, another great example would be swinging back to Marvel for a bit. The movie adaptation or the, look, they should say the uh, first movie for Iron Man. If you go through that movie, and it's kind of odd if you do the same thing with the first Incredibles as well, and you follow the storyline, both of them read through with the same air as Atlas Shrugged. And I mean, Atlas Shrugged is probably, whether you agree or disagree with the content, Atlas Shrugged was probably one of the best examples of a story built entirely to deliver a ideological platform designed entirely to put a concept in your head and to narrate a philosophy through dialogue. It's probably the most known example of that. But even in its less uh, less wordy examples, if we see the, the film versions, and not just a film adaptation of Atlas Shrugged, it's just there's a lot of stories that have taken from that. If we look at the Iron Man movies, they've done much of the same thing, especially uh, the one line where they go to the court and the courts are trying to seize the Iron Man suit. Uh, this happened in the uh, this happened in the second movie where they tried to seize the Iron Man suit at an arbitration and uh, the, Robert Downey Jr. famously delivers the line, I've successfully privatized world peace. All throughout Iron Man, not just the movies, but also in the comic books, the ultra capitalist not being a bad thing is something that bleeds through a lot of the stories. I mean, even... In most comic book universes, save two or three people, most of the super geniuses in the various universes end up being good guys. And they're usually exceedingly wealthy and they use that money for our charity and to help people. And everyone is very positive and always trying to help and improve the world, even if the real world doesn't reflect that. And I think that we see that in these forms of fiction because we want to have that we want that to be our reality. So the artists and the writers, they take what they see as a potential reality, as what they want a reality to look like. And they'll package that idea in either straightforward ways or more innocuous ways. Um, I'll give a, another example of, I guess, uh, you know, I, I was trying to, I was trying to branch out into other things and I could look at, uh, I could look at classical literature and some of the stories and moral philosophy that comes out of that or other films or even more recent uh, novels that have come out. But I think going back to going back to Stanley and the Marvel universe, I think I'll keep my, I think I'll keep the rest of my focus in the episode there for a lot of the different ideas that have come out of just the Marvel universe or comic book universe in general. So back on track, if anyone's seen the Netflix series, um, any of the Marvel Netflix series, each one of them has a very straightforward message that it tries to deliver, but it also has sub messages that are thread throughout the back plot in the, each of the seasons. I mean, one of the more straightforward ones, obviously, is uh, Luke Cage and the racial prejudice storylines, as well as inner city crime and trying to deal with those things while also dealing with uh, personal issues and everything else. And just the general life that you end up having in a city like Harlem or in an area like Harlem, I should say. But it also has a lot of backstories and ideas that it tries to enforce, such as uh, respectability politics. The idea that you can be anyone from anywhere, but there's certain standards that you should hold yourself to. You know, you don't slouch, you keep your back straight, you work hard, you get the job done. Different morals like that 
that are embedded in this character and in, in some of the other characters they deal with. But it's not the foreground message. It's the background message. It's the, this is a hero that you're supposed to look up to. So here's the traits of this hero. Here's what a person that you should look up to should embody. Another example is uh, they touch on a lot of different ideas in uh, the Jessica Jones series. Now, the foreground story of it, of course, is that she's dealing with her previous uh, captor and tormentor. But in the background of it, you deal with ideas of nihilism and how to cope with things that happen in your life. She has the uh, the character Malcolm that she plays off of where she takes pretty much the worst route for coping mechanisms, which is alienating everybody and drinking heavily, whereas he's been pretty much forced into... Actually, I'm going to stop for one second, and for the few people out there that may not have seen it yet, I'll just give you the old-fashioned spoiler alert, I guess. I'll just say that right now. The villain turned him into a drug addict. Now, in the beginning of the episodes, he is just strung out in the hallways, useless drug addict, and then... Jessica Jones reaches out, puts her own shit aside to help him get better so that he can start recovering and having a life. And he does it. He bounces back. He has far more positivity. He tries going to uh, group networking to try to work through the problems and issues that he faced, having gone through what he went through, all the stuff that we know would have benefited a character like Jessica Jones. But because of the character that she is, it wouldn't have happened. She was too nihilistic. She was too uh, cynical to go the kind of route that the character Malcolm went to work through the problems that he had. But we see that contrast and it gives us an idea from the creator's perspective as to how coping with things in a certain way will lead to being a certain way. Both characters went through horrific things, though to differing degrees, but they both went through horrific things at the hands of the same person. The difference is in the way that they choose to cope with it. So by giving us the story of how these characters cope with it, we get to see how we should cope with the different tragedies that we face in our lives. Again, it's not a story that's right in the foreground. It's a story that makes up the background of the entire show. And the examples for this kind of foreground background system that we see in a lot of our media is practically endless. Even some of the most mindless forms of entertainment that come out still have some sort of message that it tries to deliver to you. Uh, I'll, I'll remember one of my favorite movies, uh, a little movie by the name of Shoot 'em Up. Now, this was an over-the-top, excessive action movie where the character was completely ridiculous in the things that they were capable of doing, like sliding down a conveyor belt while shooting every single person with perfect accuracy, all the while eating carrots because he says it makes his eyesight better. Just completely, completely ridiculous movie, but absolutely entertaining. In this movie, though, the foreground story is all of the action and everything else, but the background story is, you know, He's the guy with the skills, so he does what he needs to do because that's what you do. You do what you need to do. If there's a problem and you need to take care of it and you see there's people that need help, even if it means that you're going to get dragged into this whole thing, you still go and you still help. The movie starts off with him sitting at a bus stop eating a carrot when he hears a woman scream. And that kicks off everything else that happens in the movie because that's the type of character he is. He gets up, he goes, he sees something going on, he might sigh to himself being a little upset that he's the guy that was in the place to go fix it, but if he's the guy that's there, then that's what he needs to do. Again, it's just supposed to be a crazy, ridiculous action movie, but it makes a point of still delivering that kind of idea in the background, because this is a character, even if you don't look up to them or anything like that, anything that excessive, you're still going to walk away with positive feelings about the character, because It's reinforced these traits that the creators want you on some level to see as positive. The the last thing I'll leave you with here is uh, actually a a book series that I recommend. Now, not that I can recommend this directly, but I'm sure some of you out there are a little more tech savvy and can find ways to read these just online rather than going out and purchasing every single book in the series. But there's a series called Pop Culture and Philosophy. 
And I absolutely love these books. I think that they are brilliantly written because of the way that they're written. So the idea behind these books is that they take a concept or a character or an artist or something like that, and they get a series of philosophers, either different professors or different accredited writers, to write in essays explaining a part of the philosophy of the character, and then they codify all of these essays together for your reading pleasure so that you can get a deeper picture of the kind of philosophy that's in play in either a certain medium, a certain writer, a certain musician. Uh, one that was actually really interesting was uh, Johnny Cash and philosophy. I could do an entire episode just on the points that were made in that book. But again, I recommend that you go out, find those books, read them. They're absolutely brilliant. And the best part with it is that when you start looking at these different either, again, genres or these artists or, or franchises through this philosophical lens, you'd be surprised the amount of takes that you can pull out of just about any form of media that you consume. Really, it comes down to being a conscious consumer, if you will. If you're watching a movie, sometimes you'll throw a movie on just to throw it on and put it in the background. Sometimes you're reading something just because you picked it up at the library. You know, it was 250 pages, larger font, so it seemed like a nice, easy read from something you picked out of the YA section because it was easier than going to an act going and getting an actual dime store novel. Regardless of what type of media you're consuming, if you put on the lens to try to pull more out of the story, you'd be surprised how much of what the artist puts into the story ends up bleeding through the pages, ends up bleeding through the screen, and especially in music. I don't even need to touch on music. Music, you can you can go on for, I could probably do 10 episodes just on different songs that have philosophical ideas behind them, and that wouldn't even be doing music justice doing it that way. Wrapping everything up, though, uh, what I will say is that if you go in, consume any form of media after hearing this podcast episode, then again, I highly recommend trying to dive in for that deeper meaning, trying to find more that you can find in your video games and your books and your movies, so on and so forth, and seeing where it fits with the rest of your life. Now, as always, you can listen to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can Read on all three of the publications associated to us, being Libertarian.com, RationalStandard.com, and Think-Liberty.com. You can check us out on YouTube. Uh, I think I already mentioned social media, but I'll mention it again in case I didn't. You can follow us on social media. And as always, if you liked what you heard and you'd like to hear more, I'll see you again next week. Excelsior!